thank you for being here. Uh, we especially want to welcome our guests who are here today, and we look forward to worshiping with you. We have communication cards that are in the pews, and we invite you to complete one of those. We don't take attendance, but we'd love to know if you have any special prayer needs or concerns, and you can place those in the uh, offering plate later on or hand it to me. We also have a gift. If you're a first-time guest today or you haven't yet received one of our gifts, you can pick one of those up in the Face Center. So please pick that up on your way out. Uh, no obligation, just spread the good news of hope. We also have coffee and fellowship immediately afterwards, so you are welcome to join us for that. Those of you who don't know, we also have coffee and fellowship before worship, and uh, that starts about 9.20 and goes until 9.50 or so, so please join us for that. That's a great time to get to meet new people as well, and we welcome our friends on Facebook who are worshiping with us. We've got a good and growing group, so thank you to uh, each of you that's worshiping with us, and we uh, invite you to like us on Facebook, and you can find our sermons uh, on a number of different social media platforms. So thank you for your support of our social media ministry. number of uh, joys we want to pass along. Uh, the hospitality team, which is uh, one of our three uh, main values that we have here at Hope Church, is hospitality. They are meeting immediately after worship. You can get, grab a cup of coffee, of course, since it's hospitality. Grab a cup of coffee, then go to the Windveen Hope House, which you can get to under that exit sign right there and go down the steps and out that door and you'll be in the Windveen Hope House. They are welcoming new members of the team today. So uh, there's no obligation if you just want to find out more about what they do and how they do it. You can join them. Anybody, if you like to uh, gather with people and help people gather and enjoy being in everyone's company, Join the hospitality team today. Also, Coffee Break, which is a women's Bible study, starts on Tuesday, also meeting in the Winveen Hope House. That's a new location this year. All women are invited, all ages. So join uh, the women who will be gathering on Tuesday. Uh, you'll see more details in the bulletin. But again, that is going to be in the Winveen Hope House. Get there the same way. You can park where you used to park, but you'll walk through and go into the Winveen Hope House. Um, and if you prefer to park on 6th Street, a little voice is telling me. <laughs> the inside joke is that's my wife, Jill, who needs no microphone. Uh, no. And she, uh, she heads up the hospitality team and uh, hosts the coffee break, so thank you, Jill, for that. And uh, she's saying that the door to the 6th Street entrance will be open as well if you want to park there and have less number of feet to walk. Also, we had a great response in our Christmas Child, uh, Operation Christmas Child boxes. We uh, were hoping we could get 25 handed out. We had 64 handed out last week. So those of you who were not here uh, Andrea is going to meet you in the Winveen Chapel uh, after worship, and she'll explain more about it to you. But it's a great project for you as an individual or for families to do together to uh, fill up a box that will then be shipped off along with thousands and thousands of others to people uh, in need around the world. So that's our Christmas mission this year. You can find details about that in the bulletin and pick up a box uh, in the chapel after worship today. Last thing, um, we are going to have a Western dinner at the end of October. Everyone, all adults uh, are invited. And uh, what we need is someone who can lead line dancing. Uh, it is not me. Um, or a square dance caller. So I, we've got to have one of those. So if you are able to do that, see me, would you? Uh, or see Jill, line dancer or a square dance caller. All right. Friends, our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and His risen Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. We come together today to worship the Lord. And so we say now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be all glory and honor forever and ever. Amen.
dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Because he loved me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Be seated. Thank you very much.
Amen. And we invite the children to come forward. If you're a guest here today, uh, we have a time where we have children come forward if they're in the age three through uh, grade five. And so they're welcome to come forward at this time. And then afterwards, we have children in worship. And uh, kids, I need your help with something today, and I have a special surprise for you. So there's two big things why I need you up here today. So come on up, everybody, and uh, see if you can help me solve my problem, all right? Can I sit next to you here? Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Come on up. We got room for you, Charlie. Hey, how are you doing? I haven't seen you since you had your tonsils out. Is everything all right? Okay, good. All right, good. So, hey, look what I got. It's not a dollar. What is it? It's money. It's two dollar bill. How about that? So you know why I have this bill? I have this because I have uh, my wife, Jill, she has some... Uh, nephews in Michigan, and they're big Michigan fans, so I don't know if you heard there was a football game last week between Michigan and Wisconsin, and because Wisconsin crushed, I mean, beat, uh, beat Michigan, he thought I should have two dollars. So now I have two dollars, and so I need your help. What do you think I should do with it? Um, buy pizza. Buy pizza? All right. That's one good thing. What else could I do with this two dollars? Hmm. Okay, what else could I do? Yes? Um, what could I do with the $2? What do you buy think? Something. Buy something, yep. What do you think? Yes? Um, buy, food. buy food. Food would be good. How about giving it to somebody? Do you think I should do that? Um, yeah, but, um, buy toys for a birthday, maybe. Buy toys for a birthday? That would be good. So, like, if you had two dollars, do you think you would uh, give it away, or do you think you'd keep it? I would keep it. You would keep it? Yeah. No, I would give it away, and you... not, I'll give it away and get a toy. Give it away and get a toy? Okay, all right. How about, you? well, what do you think? I think it would be fun to see what everybody would do with two dollars. Uh, this is all $2 bills. I have a friend, I'm going to tell your adults about it later on, but I have a friend who always gave away $2, and when he died, he gave me this big stack of $2 bills that I never knew what to do with. And so this week I thought, well, I have $2. What if I give everybody $2? Now, here's what you have to do. You have to decide if you're going to use it for yourself or give it away. Now, here's the thing about $2. If you give it to your mom or your dad or your grandpa or grandma, they could give you $1. They could give you two $1 bills, and you could split it. You could keep one, and you could give one away, or you can give all of it away, or you can keep all of it. You have to decide, all right? So talk it over. You could buy pencils for the Christmas box. You could do lots of fun stuff. So this is your challenge this week. And next week I want you to come and tell me what you did with your $2, okay? All right, so I'm going to give you this on your way out. Don't lose this money, okay? Figure out what you're going to do with it. Take it home and talk it over with your mom and dad. What should we do with our $2? Okay? All right, don't forget. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these children. We ask you to bless them. We ask that even at this young age, you will teach them about what it means to have money that you give us and how we can be good users of that money in a way that will make you happy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so come and get your $2, and then you can go to Children in Worship. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, now you've got to figure out what to do with this $2, all right? You can save it, you can spend it, you can give it. You decide what God would like you to do with it. All right? Okay. Here we go. There you are. All right. Mommy, that's not for you. Okay. All right. All right, Diane, I'm putting this here so you guard that.
Well, hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. I go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Hear also these words from Holy Scripture. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, who is above all and through all and in all. At this time, I invite the vice president of our consistory, Paul Bolger, to come forward. And I'm going to hand Paul Jill's microphone, and uh, Paul will let you know who we have here today. The elders of Hope Reformed Church have welcomed these persons who appeared before them and made profession of their Christian faith, and who have been baptized into the body of Christ. M. and Jessica Elnar, Judy Hoynick, Sandy Stewart. In making public this profession of faith, they affirm the meaning of their baptism. We ask them now to declare their faith before God and Christ Church, that we may rejoice together and welcome them as brothers and sisters in Christ. Beloved of God, I ask you to, before God and Christ Church to reject evil, to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, and to confess the faith of the Church. Do you renounce sin and the power of evil in your life and in the world? Who is your Lord and Savior? Will you be a faithful member of this congregation and through worship and service seek to advance God's purposes here and throughout the world? Now I invite the congregation to rise as we invite you to support them. Friends, do you promise to love, encourage, and support this brother and these sisters by teaching the gospel of God's love, by being an example of Christian faith and character, and by giving the strong support of God's family in fellowship, prayer, and service? We do, and we ask God to help us. And to our friends, do you promise to accept the spiritual guidance of the church to walk in a spirit of Christian love with this congregation and to seek those things that make for unity, purity, and peace. I invite all of you who share this faith to join us, uh, remain standing and join us in these words of the ancient Apostles' Creed. We recite together, as you see on the screen, if this is your faith, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He, he descended into, into hell. hell. On, On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From, from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. By the Holy Spirit, all who believe and are baptized receive a ministry to witness to Jesus as Savior and Lord, and to love and serve those with whom they live and work. We are ambassadors for Christ, who reconciles and makes whole. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. So now will you help me in welcoming these, our brother and sisters in Christ. Joyfully we receive you. Join with us as we give witness in the world to the good news. For we are all one in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And because we believe it is the whole body of Christ that offers the blessing of God upon his people, I invite you, if you are able, to raise your hand in a blessing upon our friends with these words, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. And the congregation may be seated.
As we prepare to uh, pray today, there uh, is one prayer I'm not going to make, although I'm very tempted to, because this is one of those rare days. You know, one of my uh, desires for our congregation is that we persist in seeking unity uh, despite the things that might divide us. You know, these really important issues that face our nation, such as Cubs or Brewers. Well, our drummer over here, who I respect and thank for being our drummer, he is one of several, many. We have many Chicago Cubs fans. And so, Jordan, uh, I want to say this is one of those days that Brewers fans are praying for the Cubs just as much as they are for the Brewers, and we invite you to join us. For those of you who don't follow baseball, you'll have no idea what I'm talking about, but it's a big day. So we're not going to pray about that right here. I will about 2 o'clock be praying. (laughs) We're going to pray today for uh, all of our friends who need help, but we especially want to remember those people who are listed in the bulletin, and we have an additional prayer concern for Kathy Reitz, who... uh, is struggling with some physical uh, issues in her life, so we'll be adding her to the list, as you see in the bulletin. And uh, there's an especially painful uh, passing of a family member of Jane uh, and Daniel and Erica Windmiller, so we want to be in prayer for them this week as well. Will you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, We do praise you for being a God who welcomes people into your family, into your community. What we do here today is to stand with Christ, and we're thankful for each of our friends who stands here with us to worship and to praise you and to claim you as our Lord and Savior. Lord, we thank you for our guests that are here today, whether they're first-time guests or have been here many, many times. We're thankful that they have chosen this to be a place to worship today. We pray that as they praise your name, they will receive the comfort and assurance of your love for them, that you welcome them and that you love them with an unending love that is overflowing. Lord, we thank you for the work that you continue to do through this church and your church around the world. We pray that you will give us strength and a vision And Lord, we thank you for all the people who have worked for the last year on the 2020 Vision of Hope team, and we look forward to their report as it now works its way through the consistory and to the full congregation this fall. Lord, continue to bless that vision. Give us uh, the strength and wisdom to know how to implement it as well. Father, we pray for Jim and for Harlan, for Velma, for Carla. We pray for Kathy. We pray for Jane and Daniel and Erica and Shane's entire family and his passing. We pray for Vicki and for her continued recovery as well. Lord, we lift before you all these prayer needs and so many others that uh, come before our minds. And Lord, that you know and I don't. Lord, we thank you for the way that you uh, bring healing, that you bring healing to bodies, that you bring healing to minds. And for those this day who suffer with Uh, emotional distress or anxiety or depression. Lord, we pray that you will help them to know how seriously you take these needs as, as well, that you desire to be invited to bring healing into those situations just as much as physical healing. Lord, we pray for relationships. We pray for relationships that happen in workplaces. We pray for relationships between parents and children. We pray for relationships between brothers and sisters and sisters and sisters and brothers and brothers. And Lord, we pray for husbands and wives. We pray for all of the relationships, Lord, that you call us to in our various stages of community life. Because, Lord, we know we are a people who are made for community. You created us from the very beginning to be a people who dwell together. You said it is not good for a person to be alone. And so, Lord, we thank you for the relationships, for those who are single, that they are able to develop friends within this church and in the community. Uh, For those who are widows and widowers, Lord, we pray that you will bless them as they seek out friendships that will help them to know the love of a community. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray that you will bless us uh, as we continue to strive to be a 
people after your own heart. We pray for our world and especially those places that are suffering from natural disasters. Lord, we pray for your presence there as well. We lift up all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, knowing that all we say in his name, all we ask in his name, and with a sincere heart, you hear, Lord, and you grant. And so, Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we receive today's offering, I want to let you know that uh, you continue to be an exceedingly generous con uh, congregation. We took a second offering last week for our, uh, the victims of flood so that we could support the uh, hurricane victims, and we want to let you know that you raised nearly $900 in one offering, so that's a wonderful thing. Thank you so much for your generosity. All of that money is going directly to uh, hurricane relief support. Next week is World Mission uh, Sunday, uh, World Communion Sunday, and so we will be raising money for our world missionaries. Uh, we have several world missionaries that we support, which are connected to this congregation. Uh, so we want you to, uh, and we invite you to support them. The details of each of their ministries are on the bulletin board in the Faith Center, so take a look at them and see if you're inspired to give uh, to that. That will be our second offering next week, and we're going to introduce you to uh, a new world mission as well next week uh, that happens right out of our own congregation. So come next week. It'll be an exciting day to learn about the mission of Jesus Christ as we support it throughout the world. So it is along that line, we invite you to give, make your gifts now. If you're a guest, please know this. We don't expect you to put something in the plate just because it goes by. But if it makes you joyful to bring a gift to the Lord, this is your opportunity. Come all Christians, be committed to the work of the Lord. The
please join me in a prayer for illumination on our reading this morning. God of the prophets, by the power of the Holy Spirit, speak your word to us and seal it within us that we may heed your call. Amen. Our scripture today is from 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 to 19. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. The word of the Lord. Two questions for you today, and if you uh, like to take notes, if that helps you, you are uh, welcome to make notes on the paper you'll find in the bulletin. If that's not your thing, that's all right. Uh, but we invite you to think about these questions as we go through our uh, time together thinking about God's Word. We first of all want to ask, what is in the treasure chest that you are searching for? We are all searching for something of value. And so what's on that secret map that you have, that you have some secret treasure that you've hidden or that you hope to find? I want you to think about that today, but I want you to think about it all week. So you may want to not even put an answer down until the end of the week. But there's another question that we have for you, and that is, is the God that you have come to worship here today, is that God a stingy God or a generous God? How do you think about God when you think about Him? Does God have a reputation for generosity in your mind? Again, think about that. Think about it perhaps all week before you put down your answer. 
Now, I suppose you expect me to give you an answer, as if, uh, you know, I have all of the answers, which I certainly don't. But there is an answer in our Scripture today. And I could tell you, you know, the very simple thing, you know, like uh, an old president used to say, uh, our goal is a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. But it's much more complex than that. True. We all need to eat. Paul starts there. And for those of you uh, who are new to this series, we're in our third week of reading through Timothy. And what Timothy is about, it's a letter from Paul, who was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's writing to Timothy, who is a minister of a church uh, in Ephesus, in a city called Ephesus. He's a young man, very young minister. And so Paul, the old veteran, is teaching this young man how he's supposed to teach the church. And so this is our third lesson uh, that comes to us, and we'll be continuing this for several weeks. But what Paul is saying to Timothy, you tell those people there, yes, you all need to eat. And we get that, right? We all need to eat. We all need to have shelter. We all need to have clothing. We all need to have a job if we're able so that we can pay for all of the above. We need to have material possessions that allow us to enjoy our leisure time. We need to have funds to buy jewelry for our wives. Actually, that part isn't in the Bible, but based on my personal experience, I recommend you men do write that down. So, the point is that we do need to care for ourselves. But we also need to care for our parents. Many of us are in that situation. Some of us uh, have spouses we need to care for. Some of us have children or grandchildren. Yes, these are all obligations that God lays upon us. And so God provides us with abundant blessings to do these things. These are the privileges and the obligations of life. And God wants you to have the resources to do these things. They come from God out of His divine generosity who richly, as Paul says, provides everything for our enjoyment. So that's not so much of a challenge. We all get that part. The challenge becomes when we move beyond the things we need. If we could truly be content with the things we just need, well, we could all just go home and get ready for whatever. But there are more complicated things that follow, of course. Beyond the things we have and need for our own enjoyment, we seek things which unfortunately sometimes possess us, rather than become things that we possess. Paul is teaching Timothy to counter the teaching of the false teachers that have come up in the church in Ephesus with a familiar message. The path to true treasure is a life of godliness with contentment. Now why would Paul have to teach that lesson in the church? I mean, the church is just starting up, right? Well, the church is made up of many people, just like our church. There are some people who do not have many possessions. There are some people who have many, many possessions. There are rich, there are poor, there are everywhere in between, just like our congregation. And so Paul is teaching first that Timothy should warn people, especially those who do not have a lot of possessions, who do not have a lot of money, stay away from the false teachers. We have these very same false teachers in our world today. The false teachers were preaching that uh, it seems an early model for what we see today, what is now today called the prosperity gospel. You can find it on a lot of television stations. It usually goes something like this. Send me money so I can buy a private jet and God will make you a big success. That is false. There is no scriptural foundation for that. Very recently, there were some big headlines that one of the prosperity gospel preachers, Benny Hinn, uh, made a confession and repented of his teaching of this heresy for most of his life. He was actually called to task on it by a family member of his, and he has promised that he will not teach that anymore. But you can find lots of other people who who do nothing uh, but try to get other people to send them money so they can have more. That is false. That is a false teaching of the Scripture. And just as we, as Timothy was taught to preach against it to his congregation, so we, modern-day preachers, are taught to preach against it as well. And so I have. Paul wants the church to know that you don't give money to ministers so they can be private jets or so they can get rich. That's not the, the pilgrim path to joyful living. 
Yes, needing to have a uh, adequate living, especially with budget time approaching, my wife and I thank you for keeping that other part of it in mind. But instead of that, what ministers, what everyone should pursue is a life of godliness with contentment. Be happy with what you have. It's from God. Dwell close to God, and you will find great gain. You will find treasure. Now, this is one of those ideas that on Sunday morning when the preacher says it, if you're listening to me at all, you nod and say, yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah, we expect you to say that. But then on Monday morning, you think, yeah, right, preacher, look, it's a dog-eat-dog world out there. For those of you who don't know, this is a second career for mine, maybe a third, and I get it. I know that. I've been there. I still get it. But even though we all need money, I know it. God knows it too. God will figure out how to make sure you have what you need. God, in fact, blesses us with money, with possessions, but contentment, contentment is the opposite of covetousness. And that's the point that we need to try to really understand. Contentment doesn't mean that you are not allowed possessions. God doesn't say we have to take a vow of poverty. That's not what God is calling you to do. God isn't saying being poor is a great thing. If you need proof of that, just ask someone who's unfortunately stuck in poverty. It is not a great thing. God gets that. So yes, you should want to be able to make money, but don't let that pursuit of it rule your life. That's what Timothy is being taught to preach. That's where the trouble starts in our relationship with God and others, when money rules us instead of us ruling the blessings, the money, the possessions that God has given us. You see, money itself is not evil. Money is neutral, right? Those $2 bills that I gave those kids, they're completely neutral $2 bills. They have no stake in the outcome of what happens with those $2 bills. But selfish love of money leads to all kinds of evil. I want you to think with me about this airport baggage handler. You probably heard his story. He... Uh, is accused of taking a quarter million dollars, $250,000, out of luggage that was going through the airport. It was some cash shipment somewhere. Uh, as Jill and I watched that news story, we both said, who sends $250,000 through uh, airport luggage? But anyway, they do. So no rational person would try to steal it, right? But he's a living example of this thing right here. It is selfish love of money that leads to evil. And now he will pay the price. I don't know how he thought in today's world with cameras everywhere he was going to get away with this, but that's what Paul is talking about. When we get so consumed with making more and more money, when we want to advance God's blessings just a little faster than God's willing to give them to us, we make really stupid decisions. We spend less time with the people we love. And we justify it by saying, well, I'm doing it for them. Maybe you really are. And that's a good thing. As long as you're not possessed by the pursuit of money more than you are possessed by the treasure of the relationships that God has put in your life. If your pursuit of money prevents you from serving your family, from serving your friends, from serving your parents, if your pursuit of money prevents you from serving Christ's church, if your pursuit of money prevents you from enjoying the blessings that God has given you, then you are probably failing to imitate the divine generosity of God. So here are some tests of whether or not the treasure that you're going to write down in that first line, whether you uh, have as a treasure the blessing from God. The first thing I'm going to suggest as a test is, does your life, does how you live your life, does how you use your money demonstrate a good confession? That's what Paul talks about. Just like Jesus Christ made his good confession before Pilate, so we are called to make our good confession, just like our 
four friends did right here. Do you understand the enormity of what was said right there? And all of you, uh, at least who are members of this church, and probably all of you at some point in your life, have been asked, who is your Lord and Savior? And when you stand up in public and you say, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, you stand with Christ. You stand with Jesus Christ and you say, I claim Him as the Lord of my life. And what does that mean? That means that if I am given a choice of following what the world says I should do or what Jesus says I should do, I'm going to listen to the Lord of my life because I am a servant, a slave really is what the Bible calls it, to Jesus Christ. That means I don't get to do with my possessions all of the things that my non-Christian friends get to do because I am making a conscious decision to live my life with a statement that I stand with Christ. You can pursue your treasure and stand with Christ. How? Well, the secret is to pursue divine generosity. Godliness is the good confession, first of all. Make that good confession. Live out that confession. Ask yourself, is the treasure that you are pursuing consistent with the good confession you have made that you belong to Jesus Christ? And then by imitating God's divine generosity. The life that is truly life is lived in obedience to what Paul writes, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. Our call to do these things is nothing more than what Jesus Christ And God, through Christ, has done for us. That is what we mean by divine generosity. That God gave Himself, because Jesus Christ is the Son of God, is God, and God gave Himself, His entire self, for you. There is no greater generosity than that can be. God owns the entire world. Many verses in the Psalms tell us that. And yet God gives it to you. God gives you a share of it for nothing, for free. That is divine generosity, and that's how we are called to live our lives. Not to be saved, let me make that very clear distinction. We don't preach in this church, in any Reformed faith, do we preach a gospel of salvation by works. We are saved by faith through grace alone. That's our teaching, that's our belief. You are saved not by what you do with your money, you're saved because Jesus Christ died for you. We're talking about after you've been saved. How are you going to live your life of gratitude? What's the point of good works? The point of good works is to show your gratitude to God and because you are storing up for yourselves treasures that will pay off great dividends later in your life, even today. So I want to make sure you hear what I'm trying to teach. God blesses you with money and with stuff. Enjoy it. Go ahead. God wants you to. Take hold of it. But don't confuse your money and your stuff with God. God gives you money and stuff so you can enjoy time with God, so that you can enjoy blessing God and your neighbor. So I want to tell you about my friend Chris. He died uh, quite some time ago. But before Chris died, uh, Chris gave me several stacks of $2 bills. And that's because what Chris would do, wherever he would go, he would give people $2 bills. He gave a lot more than $2 bills. He, is a living, he was a living example of a person who had a reputation for generosity. He, it kind of got out of hand. One person, uh, understanding Chris's uh, tendency to be overly generous, showed up at Chris's uh, lake cottage where Chris had a boat, a very nice boat, and this uh, friend shows up with a truck uh, that has uh, been fitted with a trailer hitch, And so when Chris comes out and he sees the truck and he sees the trailer hitch, he says, well, what do you have that trailer hitch for? Are you going to get a boat? He said, well, I came here today hoping you might give me your boat. Well, Chris didn't give him his boat. But that's a reputation for generosity. Generosity doesn't mean, of course, that you need to give people your boat. Generosity, though, is the opposite of greed. Greed, coveting, I think along with gossip, greed, gossip, those are probably really the sins that we as a church should preach about a lot more than we do. Uh, But it's difficult for us ministers because we suffer from the same sins, of course. I suffer from my own bouts with greed. I suffer from my own bouts with gossip. 
And we need to confess those and do our best in our lives to overcome that sort of sin because that is not building up the body of Christ. To avoid the sin of greed, we are called instead to live a life in which generous living is our motto, in which generous living means doing good and being willing to share what God has given us. There's a couple of people that I'd like to mention who uh, are so exemplary of this in, in my own life, in my own experience, in the life of this church. Uh, there's a woman named Lillian, Lillian Smees. She was a missionary all her life. Uh, many of, some of you know her. Many of the people who know her are no longer with us on this earth. But anyway, Lillian, uh, she would come back once every few years on leave. She was a missionary to India, and she would come back in her traditional Indian dress, And for all we knew, Lillian, uh, spending her entire life as a missionary for the Reformed Church in America, had nothing when she died. But for, I don't know if she saved every paycheck or how she did it, but Lillian died with a six-figure sum of money, and she gave all of it to Hope Church. That money, just in the time she has given it, has nearly doubled because the Lord has blessed the investments in which we were able to put it. And then other people who, the first uh, couple uh, that was working on the investment of her money, they became inspired. And when they died, they left 10% of their estate, which was, again, a six-figure sum of money, to that very same fund. And what started out as Lillian's $100,000 is now over $450,000. Now, you tell me, how does that happen in a church like this, right? Look around you. I mean, we don't have Bill Gates in our congregation. But we got a lot of people who have learned what it means to do good. Who have learned what it means to be willing to share. Who have learned what it means to give to God what God has given to us. I don't know that any of them missed anything they gave us. But I'm guessing it was a little painful to do that. Maybe it wasn't at all. Maybe they had such generous hearts. You know, it's not the amount of money. It's not the amount of money at all. Maybe for you, a dollar is $100,000 to them. It's not the amount of money that God is interested in. God is interested in this. Does that dollar rule you, or do you rule the dollar? Do you get to do good with it? That's what I'm hoping will happen with these children, that they're going to get to have a discussion with their family about what does it mean to do good? What does it mean to do good with what God has given us that we didn't even have? They didn't have that before they got here. They didn't know they were going to get it. Now they're going to get it. What should they do with it? I think God has the same question for each of us every week. When you get your Social Security check, when you get your paycheck, when you get your pension funds, whatever you get, God isn't saying you have to give it all away. Not at all. Not one second. God wants you to use it to enjoy your life. But do good with it too, right? Share it, because God has given it to you. The true treasure is truly life, both now and in the age to come. That's the thing about eternal life that Timothy is trying to teach the people there and I, you. The treasure that we seek is truly life. That life is now and in the age to come. I know, because I talked with these people who gave uh, this large sum of their estate to our uh, church, to that fund that Lillian started, their joy in knowing how it was being used, that the church was going to live decades beyond them because of their gift. That brought them real joy. That is truly life, now and in the age to come. So maybe you support Samaritan's Hand. Maybe you support uh, the Salvation Army. Maybe you support some college. Maybe you support some other church. Maybe you support some other good thing. Do something for some cause about which you will say, that helps me know true life. I appreciate that as I give this, I know God is blessing it. And that is life in this age and in the age to come. The proper understanding of wealth from the Bible's teaching is not that wealth is evil. Wealth is not evil. But rich people 
are no better and no worse than poor people. Instead, the Bible teaches that people who have greater wealth have a greater responsibility on those who possess it. Do not think you can use it to control God or Christ's church or other people. Use whatever God has given you to bless God, to bless Christ's church, to bless other people. What is the measure you should use? Divine generosity. We can never be as generous toward God and our neighbor as God is toward us because God gave us His very self to us. But we can be a church, and this is my goal, that we would be a church with a reputation of divine generosity. I love that 64 boxes are already gone and more will be gone today because that's a very simple $9 investment in world mission. We can be a church with that kind of reputation. A church which people drive up to with trailer hitches thinking they're going to drive away with the boat. So what will we hitch to the boats that people bring in? I suggest we make our goal to fill their boats with the love of God in Christ, which is overflowing, which is a full measure, pressed down, shaken, and overflowing. Let's strive to be that kind of a church, that kind of a people who have a treasure chest full of good deeds which we give freely to everyone who asks. Let's be a church, a people, who treasure giving away God's treasure. Why should we do this? Because our generous God has promised us that generous and contented living leads to true treasure, a life that is truly life. I promise you this, As you become more and more generous toward God and toward others, you will enjoy life more. You will. God promises that because you're storing up treasures for yourself here and in the life to come. It seems anti-everything we are taught in the world, right? I get it. It's counter-cultural what the Bible teaches us. And that's why you've got to come to church to hear it. But it's true. So let's learn to see doing good for God and our neighbors as investments we are making in a life that will truly pay dividends forever and ever. Search then this week for a treasure chest filled with love for God and your neighbor. Give that treasure away. Love people unceasingly with overflowing, overflowing love. Give that treasure away and the attitude of divine generosity will change you and the people you touch and then you will finally be living the high life. Truly. Amen. Shall we pray? God, it's uncomfortable for us to talk about money. Especially when we come to church, we just as soon not hear about it. Some of us, maybe all of us, And yet, Lord, there it is in your word, big as life. Why have you put all of this in your word? Not because you need it. Not because we need it. But because each of us individually deserves the blessing that comes from your divine generosity. Deserves it only because you love us. And so, Lord, help us to take what you've taught us today so that as we bless others, we will know blessings that we have never known before. Make us a divinely generous church and people. Thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.
God's love, be confident in your faith and hope, and carry the light of the cross. Bring divine generosity into the darkest corners this week, and you will finally find the true life. Go in peace. Amen.